Good morning. Turn to Proverbs chapter 25. <clears throat> Proverbs 25. We'll take our reading from there this morning. These also are the Proverbs of Solomon, which the men of Hezekiah, king of Judah, copied. It is the glory of God to conceal things, but the glory of kings is to search things out. As the heaven for heights and the earth for depths, so the heart of the king is unsearchable. Take away the dross from the silver, and the smith has material for a vessel. Take away the wicked from the presence of the king, and his throne will be established in righteousness. Do not put yourself forward in the king's presence, or stand in the place of the great. For it is better to be told, come up here, than to be put lower in the presence of a noble. Let's pray together. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. This morning's text begins another section of the Proverbs. Alright, so we've hit that last stretch of the book of Proverbs where... um, uh, we've, we notice that we've got different collections of Proverbs put together in this one book. Uh, we've just finished uh, the sections uh, called the words of the wise um, and the sayings of the wise. The heading of chapter 25 tells us, These also are Proverbs of Solomon, which the men of Hezekiah, king of Judah, copied. Uh, And that's all that we're given about these Proverbs, uh, stretching from chapter 25 through chapter 29. Um, One imagines that uh, maybe some sages working in the court of King Hezekiah uh, we're going through the archives, um, and perhaps you know, much like whenever Josiah was having work done, and the uh, the scroll of the law was found, uh, perhaps one day they stumbled across some additional proverbs uh, that were written by King Solomon that they hadn't previously known of, um, and so they put them in the mix with the rest of these Proverbs. Uh, However they came to be here, uh, that's what the text tells us about them. They're Proverbs of Solomon, which the men of Hezekiah, king of Judah, copied. I want to focus our attention this morning on just this first section of Proverbs chapter 25. You know, normally, we'll go through the whole chapter and we'll make some observations about the chapter. Um, as you can see, it, if your if your translation is broken down into paragraph forms, um, the the text of Proverbs chapter 25 is broken down into a couple of different collections of proverbs. Um, or we could all we could call each collection a proverb that's made up of several aphorisms. The first one that we've read this morning all focuses on uh, on kings. Now, I think there's a case to be made that the whole chapter is meant to be read as a single wisdom poem. Uh, we might talk about that next week. Uh, but as it is, this poem is divisible into several sections. And this first one focuses on kings. It's the glory of God to conceal things, but the glory of kings is to search things out. All right, the heart of kings is unsearchable. Take away the wicked from the presence of the king, and his throne will be established in righteousness. Don't put yourself forward in the king's presence. All right, the focus is kings, uh, but there are two other parties that uh, this proverb talks about. The first being God. It is the glory of God to conceal things. Uh, Then the proverb talks about kings. And then the last party uh, that this proverb talks about, and the party that is addressed in this proverb, is simply you. Do not put yourself forward in the king's presence or stand in the place of the great, for it is better to be told, come up here, than to be put lower in the presence of a noble. 
Right? So there are three parties talked about, God, the king, and you. But the whole thing is addressed to you. So just you and me, Joe Schmo, uh, and how we relate to the king. Uh, So if we remember the rest of our knowledge about the Proverbs, everything that we've studied up to this point in the book of Proverbs, um, the total message of this proverb, verses 2 through 7, can be restated this way. That God's glory consists in His being unsearchable. Right? It's the glory of God to conceal things. Uh, God is holy above all other things. All wisdom and all knowledge begins in Him. But nobody can search Him out. Right? It's His glory to conceal things. The king, in his way, imitates God. Notice the two things that are said about the king in verse 3. As for the heavens for height and the earth for depth, so the heart of kings is unsearchable. And Actually, I should have started at the end of verse 2. This is the second thing that's told us about the king. Uh, that the heart of kings is unsearchable. In this way, he imitates God. He imitates what we've just learned about God at the beginning of verse 2. It's the glory of God to conceal things. And just as uh, God is concealed, just as God is unsearchable, the king in his own way is unsearchable. Um, but the first thing that we read about the king at the end of verse 2 is that it is the glory of kings to search things out. Uh, not necessarily to uh, try to find out all of the things that God has hidden, uh, but he's saying there's two different kinds of glory here. The glory of God is to conceal. The glory of kings is to search things out. Uh, in other words, to gain wisdom, to gain knowledge. And again, as we've read in the book of Proverbs already, that's the purview of God. Right? It's the fear of the Lord that is the beginning of wisdom. It's the fear of the Lord that is the beginning of knowledge. Uh, the, the lady wisdom uh, early in the book tells us that in the beginning she was with God and that God created things through wisdom. Right? That God has always possessed wisdom and knowledge. And so in these two ways, the king imitates God. Since God is the source of wisdom and knowledge, the glory of the king is to search things out. And just as God is unsearchable, so the heart of a king is unsearchable. The king searches things out with the aid of his court. Notice the the progression of this proverb. It moves from uh, the task of the king searching things out while he himself is unsearchable to the nature of the king's court. Verse 4, Take away the dross from the silver, and the smith has material for a vessel. Take away the wicked from the presence of the king, and his throne will be established in righteousness. And think of all of the examples that we have had in Israel's history uh, of kings who prosper under good counsel uh, and kings who fall under bad counsel. Think uh, especially, for instance, of Solomon's own son that we read about uh, earlier as we were studying in the Proverbs. Uh, we considered his story uh, and how... The Lord was punishing Solomon, much in the same way that Solomon himself had been writing about in the book of Proverbs. And that Solomon's son, part of what he does is that he ignores good counsel and he listens to bad counsel. And so he himself becomes a fool because of the counsel that's being given him. So the the way that kings search things out is through their counselors, the aid of their court. The king with a crooked court comes to ruin. And the king with a righteous court is established. This might leave us with this question, well, if we're taking away the wicked from the king's court, and if we're wanting to bring the righteous in, well, how do we get the righteous in? Or what if I myself am convinced that I can be of service to the king. Uh, What if I'm among the righteous? How do I be of service in that? So the next aphorisms in this proverb, do not put yourself forward in the king's presence or stand in the place of the great, for it is better to be told, come up here, than to be put lower in the presence of a noble. 
This is where the proverb turns its attention to us, the readers. The righteous come into the king's court not by putting themselves forward, but instead waiting to be told, come up here. Uh, This final instruction in the proverb this morning should remind us, uh, this should sound familiar, right? Uh, This should remind us a lot of the Lord's parable that He tells in Luke chapter 14. Uh, Go ahead and turn to Luke chapter 14 briefly. Uh, We'll consider this parable. Luke chapter 14, we're going to start in verse 7. Now he told a parable to those who were invited when he noticed how they chose the places of honor, saying to them, When you're invited by someone to a wedding feast, do not sit down in a place of honor, lest someone more distinguished than you be invited by him, and he who invited you both will come and say to you, Give your place to this person, and then you will begin with shame to be taken to the lowest place. But when you are invited, go and sit in the lowest place, so that when your host comes, he may say to you, Friend, move up higher. Then you will be honored in the presence of all who sit at table with you. This kind of sounds like, uh, honestly, this sounds like the Proverbs. Not just the proverb that we've just read, but the Proverbs in general. This sounds like good practical advice. Right, just for day-to-day living, you know, don't exalt yourself because you'll end up embarrassing yourself, right? But instead, be humble and let others exalt you, right? The Lord gives us a moral to this story that goes beyond just our practical day-to-day living. Verse 11, For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. And we understand that there's a spiritual application to be made to this. Uh, That, for example, God resists the proud but gives grace to the humble, as we're told elsewhere. Uh, But that's the moral of the story. Don't put yourself in a high place because you will be humbled. Instead, put yourself in a low place so that you can be exalted. And that seems to be the advice that Solomon is giving here in this morning's proverb in Proverbs 25. Don't put yourself forward in the king's presence or stand in the place of the great, for it is better to be told, come up here, than to be put lower in the presence of a noble. Uh, The one who exalts himself will be humbled, and the one who humbles himself will be exalted. So according to this proverb, our lot in things is to be humble first and foremost. This is something that we talked about in another regard um, a few weeks ago. But I want us to consider the way that Solomon treats humility in this particular proverb. Uh, Because only through humility will we be in a position to influence others for good. Uh, That's the basic message of this proverb. If the king's job is to search things out, and if the king relies on his court, the way that good and righteous people end up in the court of the king is through humility. Humility before the king is the predominant theme of this proverb, not just this last bit that we've read in verses 6 and 7. Because... That theme, humility before the king, also begins the proverb. This whole proverb is wrapped up in the idea of being humble before the king. Consider the first saying of the proverb. It is the glory of God to conceal things. So we learn that God's glory consists in concealing things. We then learn that the heart of the king is unsearchable. At the end of the proverb, we learn that we must be humble to be exalted before the king. Part of what this proverb does, what I want us to focus our attention on this morning, is that this proverb teaches us lessons about God. Uh, moving from, it, it makes an argument from the lesser to the greater. Think of it this way. All right, we're to be humble before the earthly kings. 
Because the proverb tells us the heart of kings is unsearchable. Well, if the heart of a human king is unsearchable, then how much more unsearchable is the holy God whose glory consists in concealing things? If a human being is unsearchable, how much more so the God of heaven? And if we must be humble to approach a human king, how much more humble must we be to approach our heavenly king? If we take these lessons together, we must especially be humble in what we claim to know about the unsearchable God. And that's where I want us to focus our attention this morning. If it is the glory of God to conceal things, and if it is our place to be humble, uh, then we must take care what we say about our God. Consider what we read in John chapter 1 about the coming of Jesus. John chapter 1 In verse 18, John tells us no one has ever seen God. The only God who is at the Father's side has made Him known. Alright, now that last part is critical. That last part is really important. We'll come back to it. Uh, That revelation about God comes through Jesus. But John tells us plainly, no one has ever seen God. No one has truly been in His presence. He is a great unknown to us. And John is only repeating to us things that we should already know by this point in Scripture. Uh, Consider whenever Moses is on the mountain and he wishes to see God. Remember, God won't let him see his face uh, because he knows that he would be destroyed by it. Um, Or consider how the prophets, even in the presence of only the angel of the Lord, are humbled and thrown down to the ground and become worshipful. Or consider what the Lord says about Himself. Uh, Turn to Isaiah chapter 55. Isaiah chapter 55, verse 8. The Lord testifies of Himself, My thoughts are not your thoughts. Nor are my ways, uh, sorry, nor are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts higher than your thoughts. Uh, The Lord says, we're not on the same page. Alright, the the stuff that you're thinking is not the stuff that I'm thinking. The way that you behave is not the way that I behave. The reason we're not on the same page, the Lord says, is because we're not even in the same book. We're not even in the same library. The difference is that great between the Lord and us. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways and my thoughts than your thoughts. You can't put a measurement to that. There's no no way that we could express this difference other than turning to to hyperbole. What's, What's the difference between the height of heaven and the height of the earth? It's infinite. Right? There's not a, a, a finite number to that. It's something that we cannot comprehend. And the Lord is saying His ways and His thoughts are that much higher than ours. The degree of separation between us and God is immeasurable, incomprehensible. Or consider what we learn through the story of Job. Uh, Turn to Job chapter 42. You remember the basic story of Job. uh, That the the Lord gives the adversary permission uh, to test and to torment Job. Job loses practically everything. um, And in the midst of his suffering, he refuses to curse God. Uh, But over the course of the book of Job, as he's discussing things with his three friends, uh, he begins to to challenge God's judgment. And going back even as early as Job chapter 13, uh, Job is, is requesting, if only I could get before God to make my case, uh, then he would know that I've been wronged. 
Right? I've not committed any sin. I've not done anything to deserve any of this. Just let me plead my case before God and He'll know. And at the end of the book, God gives him his wish. And it's one of those clear examples, be careful what you wish for because you just might get it. The Lord appears to Job out of the whirlwind and challenges him. Uh, Chapter 38, verse 2. Who is this that darkens counsel by words without knowledge? God tells Job, look, you're ignorant. You do not know what you're talking about. And speaking out of your ignorance, you are darkening counsel. In other words, you're not only foolish yourself, you're leading others into folly through the nonsense that you are speaking in your ignorance. Dress for action like a man, God says. I'll question you and you make it known to me. Right? As if God needs a man, Job, to make anything known to him. The one who knows everything because he made everything. And he spends the next several chapters dressing Job down and showing him that the kind of challenge that he's making is way above his pay grade. God asks Job, where were you when I made everything? Where were you when I set the foundations of the earth? Where were you when I made the storehouses of water? Where were you whenever I created all of the animals? Do you know how everything works? And he runs through a list of sometimes oddly specific things. You know, like, do you know how long an ostrich gestates? I I don't know. It's it's like uh, it's like at the end of. You know, Monty Python and the Holy Grail, right? When they're trying to get across the bridge and, uh, you know, the, the question at the end is not all that easy, right? You know, what is your quest? You know, or what is your name? What is your quest? What is your favorite color? That, that stuff's easy. Uh, but then at the end, you know, he's asking, you know, what is the airspeed velocity of an unladen swallow? I don't know. Who knows that? That's what a random thing to ask. And God hits Job with that. You know how long it takes an ostrich to give birth? Or how about a goat? Or And then he, I mean, he runs through all of natural philosophy. He runs through all of science. Asking Job, well, hey, smarty pants, since you know everything and I don't, how about you explain all of this to me? And by the end, Job realizes that he has been beaten totally to pieces. In Job chapter 42, verse 1, Then Job answered the Lord and said, I know that you can do all things, and that no purpose of yours can be thwarted. Who is this that hides counsel without knowledge? Therefore I have uttered what I did not understand, things too wonderful for me which I did not know. Hear, and I will speak. I will question you, and you make it known to me. I had heard of you by the hearing of the ear, but now my eye sees you. Therefore, I despise myself and repent in dust and ashes. Job spends much of his his confession here, uh, of his penitence here, confessing what he doesn't know. I've uttered what I didn't understand. Things too wonderful for me which I did not know. I had heard of you, he says, by the hearing of the ear, but now my eyes, now my eye sees you. In other words, I thought that I knew who you were, but really I didn't, Job says. In the end, we're only left with one thing that Job knows. And it's what he opens with in verse 2. I know that you can do all things and that no purpose of yours can be thwarted. Now, by the way, does that seem like a satisfying answer to Job's question? You know, why, Job's asking, why do I have to suffer all of this? Why have all my children been killed? Uh, why, why has everything been taken from me? Why has everything been destroyed? Why have I been plagued with boils? The answer that Job arrives at is, I know that you can do all things and that no purpose of yours can be thwarted. But again, it doesn't necessarily give us a reason. 
why Job suffered all the things that he suffered. Because Job comes to understand by the end of the book of Job that he does not need to understand why he suffered all of those things. The only thing he needs to understand is that our God is the one who can do all things, whose purpose can never be thwarted. And he repents because he presumed to judge God. And we likewise must take care when we judge His ways and when we question things, uh, when we start wondering about things that frankly are above our pay grade. Uh, we should instead consider the faith of Abraham. And if you've been out here um, in the uh, the auditorium class with us over the last couple of weeks as we've been studying through Genesis, uh, you'll remember this discussion that we've had from Genesis chapter 22 uh, and what the faith of Abraham consists of. In Genesis chapter 22, remember God tests Abraham. So after Isaac was born... In verse 1, we read, God tested Abraham and said to him, Abraham, and he said, Here I am. He said, Take your son, your only son Isaac, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains of which I shall tell you. Excuse me. And we talked about in the auditorium class what an impossible situation this puts Abraham in. In the last chapter, uh, God told Abraham to send Hagar and Ishmael away, that Ishmael, his other son through Hagar, would not share in the inheritance of Isaac. Right Through Isaac shall your descendants be named, God tells Abraham. It's not going to be through Ishmael. You can't look at Ishmael as, a, as an insurance policy, as a backup plan. It's going to be Isaac. And based on that, we know, and Abraham knows, Isaac has to live. If God has promised, and he does what he says he will do, it's the confession of Job, no purpose of God's will be thwarted. And so if God intends for Isaac to be the son of promise, if God intends for all of Abraham's heirs to be named through Isaac, then Isaac has to live. You can't get around it. And yet, here at the beginning of chapter 22, the commandment of the Lord is take your son, your only son, he's reminding us, reminding Abraham, there's no other option for all of these promises I've given you. It's only Isaac. Take your son, your only son, Isaac, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains of which I shall tell you. And if Abraham is to be faithful to God, again, if God's purpose is not to be thwarted, if Abraham's going to go along with it instead of trying to fight it, then at the end of the day, Isaac must die. That's an impossible situation. Because both of those things have to be true. Isaac must live and Isaac must die. It's enough to drive someone insane if you take God seriously. All right, now if we don't take God seriously, we can just kind of you know, shrug this off and say, ah, no big deal, not really think about it, not pay attention to it. But if you take God seriously, this is maddening. Isaac really must live and he really must die at the same time, in the same circumstance. And what we said about Abraham is that the evidence of his faith is that he goes along with things. He, and he doesn't question it. The next thing we read about Abraham, his immediate response, so Abraham rose early in the morning, saddled his donkey, took two of his young men with him and his son Isaac. And he cut the wood for the burnt offering and arose and went to the place of which God had told him. However it's going to work out, it's going to work out. Right? And as we studied, the Hebrew writer tells us that Abraham essentially had an early faith in the resurrection. Uh, that uh, that, I, that he would receive Isaac back from the dead, which in a sense, figuratively, he did, the Hebrew writer tells us. 
But Abraham put his humble trust in God whenever he didn't understand his ways. This is the very meaning of faith. Putting our trust in God when things do not make sense. Right? And just like with Job. Did Job's circumstance make any more sense by the end of the book of Job than it did at the beginning of Job? Not really. Not, at least not to Job. And honestly, even to us as readers, his circumstances make a lot more sense at the beginning of the book when we see God calling the shots. Uh, we've not really learned much over the course of the book in terms of why Job had to suffer what he suffered. But Job finally learns to put his trust in God. Abraham puts his trust in God. Again, even whenever things do not make sense. And by the end of Abraham's story, we're told that his faith, his willingness not to withhold your son, your only son, as the angel says to Abraham, that this is the very meaning of the fear of the Lord. That we humble ourselves before God, that Abraham humbles himself before God and puts his trust in God that things will work out even though we do not understand. And it is this kind of humility that we have to have. Because we stand before a holy God who is not like us. His ways are higher than our ways. His thoughts are higher than our thoughts. His purposes will not be thwarted. We have not seen Him. We do not know Him as fully as He is to be known. Because it is, it's beyond our ability to know Him as fully as He, uh, as fully as He is. So the call this morning is to consider the Lord humbly. God resists the proud but gives grace to the humble. And so we have to commit ourselves to being humble in our thoughts about God and being humble in the way that we, uh, that we follow out His commandments, that we obey Him. Don't think for a minute that you can have God all figured out and that you can put Him in a little box, that you can explain Him with perfect knowledge and perfect clarity, either to somebody else or even to yourself. Consider, for example, that we confess many things about God that are beyond our understanding. We call them mysteries. Uh, not mystery in the sense of, well, here's this thing that's unknown, but if we put together all the evidence, if we're sufficiently like Sherlock Holmes or Hercule Poirot, that we will figure things out in the end. Right? Not that kind of mystery. It's mystery in the old sense of the word mystery, meaning you can't know this. Right? Mysteries in mystery stories are not really mysteries. They're just stuff you haven't figured out yet. And the story is about figuring it out. Uh, by the end, it proves that it was not, in fact, a mystery, but perfectly knowable, if only you knew all the facts and used your human reason. A mystery, a true mystery, is something that is outside of our ability to know. It's not even on the table. It is not an option to say, well, you know what, if I study long enough, if I think about it long enough, if I talk to enough people, that eventually I will figure this out. Not an option. Consider the things that we say about God. Consider, for example, His existence. Uh, we say that He is uncaused. In other words, nobody caused God to exist. How does that work? I don't know. Because literally everything uh, that we encounter is caused. Everything that we encounter is an effect. I am an effect. Each of you is an effect. We do not live in a universe that is uncaused, and yet we confess that He is. Uh, that there was no one before Him, no one caused Him to come into existence. He simply exists. He simply is. Uh, or consider what we confess about His nature. Uh, how many gods do we worship? 
obviously one. I mean, that's like basic, basic Bible school question, right? We worship one God, and yet we worship Him in three persons, as evidenced in the New Testament. Uh, we, we worship Him as God the Father. We worship Him as God the Son. And we worship Him as God the Holy Spirit. And we confess that those are three distinct persons. And in fact, we see them at work. I mean, one of the most bewildering passages of Scripture uh, is in the Gospels, really early on. Turn to Matthew, chapter 3. Matthew chapter 3, beginning in verse 13. Then Jesus came from Galilee to the Jordan uh, to John to be baptized by him. John would have prevented him, saying, I need to be baptized by you, and do you come to me? But Jesus answered him, Let it be so for now, because it is fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness. Then he consented. And when Jesus was baptized, immediately he went up from the water, and behold, the heavens were opened to him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and coming to rest on him. And behold, a voice from heaven said, This is my beloved Son, with whom I am well pleased. You ever stop to consider just how bewildering this event is? What happens here in these last verses? Jesus comes up from the waters of baptism and the Spirit of God descends on Him as a dove and the voice comes from heaven declaring, This is my beloved Son with whom I am well pleased. And we confess that each one of those three persons is God. That Jesus is God. That the Spirit that descended on Him is God. That the voice that came from heaven was the voice of the Father who is God. And that they are all one God. But they're not three different gods. They're one God. And yet, you could perceive them as three different persons. How on earth does that work? Nobody knows. Right, there have been all kinds of arguments and debates about this for the entire history of the faith. If you go back in church history, all of the early debates, all of the early heresies had to do with the nature of God and specifically the nature of Jesus. Either denying, uh, you know, one of the things that we've talked about that we worship one God and saying that we worship three, uh, or denying that God appears in three persons, uh, denying that the Son or the Spirit are God, um, all kinds of things that, again, don't hold up to Scripture, but they hold up to human reason, they help us make sense of things, and they look attractive to us. And so we're, you know, some people have been willing to say, well, I'll give up the Word of God to assuage my reason, to make things make sense to me. And the Scriptures say, no. No, if you want to be faithful, you confess the mystery. You can't understand it, but that's the way it is. Or the nature of Christ, that He is fully human, but that He is also fully God. All right, again, all kinds of early heresies arose over the nature of Jesus. Some people denied that He was actually God uh, or the Son of God. Some people denied that He was fully human. Uh, those people were called docetists. They, they thought that, uh, that Jesus was only pretending to be human as He dwelt among men. And the Scriptures don't leave us room for any of those things. If we want to be humble before God, we have to confess the mysteries as they are and understand that they're just beyond our apprehension. We don't get them. Much like Abraham's situation with Isaac. You know, we, just, we don't get it. We just have to leave it at that. This is a form of faithful submission to God where we accept what He tells us about Himself even whenever we don't understand it. That our ability to understand it is not a prerequisite for our obedience. And finally, we should never ever think as if God has to justify Himself to anyone. That's the basic lesson of Job. 
He doesn't have to justify himself to the skeptics that we know. Right, you may have friends or co-workers or family uh, who uh, say that they are skeptical for this, that, or the other thing. You know, they, they don't believe in God because X, Y, Z. Usually the reasons given are not the real reasons why. But they always ask questions along the, the lines of, well, if God is so good and powerful, then why does He allow X, Y, or Z to happen? Why are there centipedes if God is so good? Right? Or uh, is God, can God make a rock that is so heavy that He can't lift it? You know, being some kind of a chucklehead. Um, We need, to, we need to take care whenever we try to address questions like that. Because I think our instinct in wanting to be helpful uh, and wanting to guide other people is to address their questions as stated. Uh, to try to satisfy those doubts as they've been expressed. The problem is that whenever we do that... Uh, whenever we try to satisfy those questions in the way that they're put, it leaves the person that we're talking to and places us in our response in that same faithless frame of mind. Right? It, it, remember that the Lord, whenever He has questions put to Him in the Gospels, how often does Jesus just answer a, a straight question with a straight answer? Almost never in the Gospels. Because first off, how many straight questions are there in the Gospels? Almost none. All of the people who are asking Him questions have some agenda, some angle. The question that they ask is not really the question that they're after. And Jesus gets that. And He always reframes things on them. He always flips the script. And we would do well to follow after the pattern of our Lord. Uh, that whenever somebody says, well, why would God do this? Or why would God do that? Or why this, that, or the other thing? Don't answer the question as if you assume it's true. Right? Don't allow that question to stand framed the way that it is. We will never preside over God's trial. Y'all, God is never going to be uh, you know, on the, in the witness stand accountable to us. It never, ever works out that way. Instead, do, again, what the Lord Himself does. Uh, or consider, this is something that came up in our Bible uh, meetup a couple of Tuesdays ago as we were studying through the prophet Ezekiel. Uh, go to Ezekiel chapter 18. Verse 25, look at the way that God Himself deals with these accusations and these questions. Ezekiel 18.25, Yet you say, the way of the Lord is not just. Hear now, O house of Israel, is my way not just? Is it not your ways that are not just? Notice the way that He's, I mean, he's completely flipped it on them. He doesn't have to satisfy their question. He doesn't have to satisfy their accusation. He doesn't have to prove himself just to them. All he has to do is tell them the truth. Yeah, my way's just. You're the one that's not just. Right? Why does God, you know, allow bad things to happen to good people? I don't know. Why does God allow good things to happen to you? Maybe don't phrase it that way uh, as, you're, as you're talking to your skeptical friends and relatives. But don't put them in the. Don't give them uh, the idea that they're in the position of judge over God. He doesn't have to justify himself to them, and he certainly doesn't have to justify himself to you. In all things, we are to remain humble. Because it is the glory of God to conceal things. And we are not to put ourselves forward in the king's presence or stand in the place of the great, but rather to be told, come up here, than to be put lower in the presence of the noble. And our Lord Jesus has given us that divine come up here. 
Remember what John said, no one has seen God, but Jesus has shown Him to us. Jesus invites us into the kingdom. Consider almost all of His ministry is focused on the kingdom and how you get into it and how you stay in it and how you remain faithful until the King returns. So the call this morning is to be faithful, to be humble before God. If you're with us this morning and you have not become a disciple of Jesus, if you are not following the King, we invite you to do that this morning. Jesus has purchased the rewards of eternal life for us through His life, death, and resurrection. But it is only through Him that we have those things. Eternal life does not come through any other means. And so if you're among us and you have not chosen to follow Him, repent of your sins. Confess Jesus as Lord and be baptized for the remission of your sins. Or it may be that you're here and you have fallen away and you're in need of restoration. Or it may be that you're here and you are struggling with something that you, uh, that you want the prayers of the congregation for. Whatever your need may be, we stand ready to help you if you'll make that need known by coming forward as together we stand and sing.